Hello and welcome to Earth Star Observatory. I'm Lily Walker and I'm an astrologer and a religious educator practicing classical astrology from the foundation of esoteric studies and my refuge in the Dharma. And today I'm here to talk with you a little bit about some of the things that I've been thinking about and learning about lately, especially as it relates to this book, which is called Ancient Philosophy, Mystery and Magic by Peter Kingsley. And I want to take a second uh, before we get in to all to the presentation that I've prepared for you today to just say hello and welcome and thank you. I've gotten a lot of new subscribers here on the channel lately, and I just wanted to say thank you for that. Uh, and I appreciate your being here and keeping company with me. Um, one of the things that I teach here on the channel or have taught in the past is about the wheel of the year and like the kind of the growing season and the cycle of the year as breathing. And also like got really into um, studying the Ptolemy's predictive package that Martin Genstein and Benjamin Dykes and some other Charlie Overt and other people have taught um, and helped me to learn about. And, um, you know, kind of combining those two things, um, you know, this year, my my predictive package, my solar return didn't exactly um show up with what it is that I wanted to do, you know, with this year, you know, or what my goals and objectives were, you know, necessarily. Um, but, you know, kind of seeing that disparity of what I wanted to accomplish, what versus what was showing up uh, that sort of spirit and God wanted me to work on this year and kind of the, the disparity or difference between those two, uh, I decided to go for, you know, when it came time in the, in the growing cycle and the, and the wheel of the year to put something out this year, like my rose that I'm growing this year. Um, you know, I put out a couple of videos like asking for help from you guys to help research the topic that I would like to write a book on or work with in the future. And uh, because because this year my my solar return chart didn't really support actually writing that book or producing a lot of like really rational hard hitting content because I had Mercury and Pisces in the return and so um, yeah but like the the re response that I got from that was like super overwhelming and helpful and you guys like helped me a lot and I really appreciate that um, you know you can maybe go if excuse me, if you didn't see those videos and you're interested, like you could go back and see sort of the process of my growing cycle for this year and what I've been working on. And um, yeah, so I just really appreciate you guys being here and the energy that you like helped me to learn more and move forward with my research and my topics, because that's like following your bliss, right? And so you guys are helping to bring joy into my world. Uh, and yeah, just acknowledging that like, I am not the expert on this stuff. Uh, I just happened to read this book and find it uh, super fascinating. And I'm also not really a qualified Dharma teacher. I'm just a, st <clears throat> a student like you guys, right? And, um, or maybe you're more advanced than me, right? Probably. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I hope that you enjoy this presentation. Uh, the way that I'm going to approach it is that I'm going to eventually share my screen and you'll be see able to see a better image of the chalkboard that I've drawn for this presentation, and you'll be able to see the quotes that I've pulled out from this book. And I'm pretty much going to let Peter Kingsley lead the way here. Um, but I will offer some commentary and just things I've been thinking about and, you know, uh, just to spark a conversation. But again, I think probably some of the comments may be more uh, astute than the commentary that you get from me. So um, also acknowledging that like, I am not the best artist, but the chalkboard that you see behind me is like heads and shoulders so much better than I used to draw before I did Waldorf education, uh, homeschool with my son. And, um, you know, this chalkboard I've prepared is really just me working through the material and kind of getting it into the imagination and the imaginal realm and just kind of working with it. I remember my son's father, like he knows what a bad artist I was <laughs> because he was, he's actually a really good artist, like a painter. He, he paints and draws really well. And um, yeah, like when we first met and he would tell me to abstract my poems and um, 
yeah, it's really a good idea to do, though. And I think, uh, you know, Rudolf Steiner and the Waldorf education really teaches the kids that as well. Right. They work with or they work with a, a lesson block and then they put it in a lesson book where they draw a picture and they uh, kind of write a few sentences about it. But like kind of something about the process of drawing the picture really helps us to um yeah, work with or process the material and kind of get it into a different space than our headspace. So um, yeah, without further ado, now I'm going to share the screen and uh, kind of talk with you about some of the interesting things that I found here in this book. Okay. Okay, so uh, in my opinion, this view is very much better. Uh, so that way, then you get the clarity of the chalkboard kind of comes through, and you can see the text here uh, that I pulled out and 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 given you a copy of from the book. So I do want to let you know just a little bit of what I'm going to talk about today. So that way, then you are able to kind of get the quotes that you want and the areas of uh, that are you're interested in or that apply to maybe your research topics and things like this, skip forward, fast forward, or and maybe know what you're missing out on if you go ahead and turn it off. So um, let me just tell you a few of the things that we're going to be talking about today. So the first thing I'm going to do is talk to you just a little bit about who Peter Kingsley is and about like kind of set the context for what this book is about. And then the next thing I'm going to do is we're going to talk about, um, um, I'm going to help tell you a version of the pre-Socratic creation myth. And we're going to talk a little bit about how um, the, the four elements and alchemy and the dark sun. And then we're going to get into this a little bit into the collective unconscious. And we're going to talk about the fires that like that burn here in our hearts, like our Promethean spark and how that is reflected in the sky and like as above, so below and outside and inside and kind of talk about how that's working a little bit. And then we're going to um, get into uh Tartars proper. I don't even know if I say that word right. <laughs> I learned from reading and so I often pronounce words wrong. So please forgive me if that if I don't say it right. But we're going to get into Tartarus proper and the pit and the underworld and uh and um, talk about like kind of the geography of the underworld and the four rivers and how they correspond to the elements and temperaments. And I'm going to make a couple of connections between my practice of that I've learned of Tibetan Buddhism and kind of just talk about how I'm relating with that material a little bit. And then um, we're going to also, the, my favorite part is that we're going to talk about the Philolaic schema or cosmology and about how this was a man who taught before Socrates and that um, how, how Copernicus really kind of looked at this material and that's what kind of he had a misunderstanding of this material and that's what kind of birthed the whole Copernican cosmology and so we're going to talk about it a little bit in more in terms of how I would understand it and also how I'm very encouraged to see that Peter Kingsley seems to be understanding it and um, so yeah let me see I, I, and it really, it's all about how like the scholars and academics are misunderstanding this information a little bit. Like I'm not even sure that we have a proper diagram that I've seen on the internet, um, you know, of, of other scholars who have worked on this and diagrammed what they think that system looks like. Um, and that's because I think there's a stubbornness to hold on to the Copernican system. And that, that so, and because of that stubbornness and reifying that view, they're not able to see what's actually being said there, which has a lot more to do with the blue shift, uh, which I affectionately call Joachim, but like Joachim or the blue pillar and that blue shift uh, part of the esoteric information um, and how, you know, the things that we know about that. And from the context of what Peter Kingsley is saying here, it sounds like that's where he's coming from, um, because there are quite a few of the key words in, in the quotes that I'm going to read you. So, um, so yeah, so like I said, the first thing that I'm going to talk to you about is who Peter Kingsley is. And you know, honestly, I don't really know a whole lot about him. Uh, the The way that I found this information is that like through you guys, like I put the the post up like or the video asking for help working on um, how to understand, you know, as if in classical astrology, like, um, you know, we're going back to Project Hindsight and we're looking at this classical information about how to how to kind of go backwards and revise our practice and understand really how do we use, how were these methods used before they fell out of vogue and out of use? And, uh, you know, 
you know, before Alan Leo kind of popularized astrology again, and we kind of went off in a bit of a different direction, like, you know, in Project Hindsight, the astrologers are kind of going backwards, researching how the actual methods work. And my question is, what was the philosophical basis behind those methods? Like, how was the philosophy working before we had sort of a, and I, I don't mean this to be a polemic, but before we had sort of a Christian, um, um, influence like uh like how, how we kind of got distracted by christianity or what happened in constantinople basically like around 325 and then you know kind of before like you know during before this happened like what how were we understanding the philosophy that was the basis of our astrological practice and also just how can we you know think about how to more right-brained ways of approaching our astrology practice and and also embodying it as a path as opposed to um you know thinking about it <laughs> or you know like how do we actually do what's the point and how do we get inside of it a little more and so i asked you guys that and one of the friend one of my friends <laughs> michelle let me know that there's this book theurgy and the soul by gregory shaw and i find this super fascinating because it also well i'm going to get back to peter kingsley i promise but like also like i had put up a video on astro theurgy like a few years ago just kind of after the inspiration that i got in meeting my friend and one of my teachers santo spinacci and the things and some dreams i was having etc and i put up this video and this was like my understanding of like what i had researched what i figured out but I didn't have any professors to kind of like check my work up against. I'm just out here by myself. And I didn't really know if it, if what I was saying was correct or not. And how can I write a book if I don't know if it's even right or correct, right? Or if I'm just like, ooh, kind of like pipe dreaming, right? Or making things up that, that make sense to me and my world, but aren't really um, historical or accurate and so in reading this book and then also kind of looking at, at Gregory Shaw's work a bit um some of the things I found on, on academia.com I see that I actually was pretty right on the money with the things that I was thinking and and writing about in that video and that I noticed that that he's even going on now to that his next book is going to be about relating this material to sort of I'm thinking the five Dakini Mandala or the five Buddha families and uh, much like I've I've drawn here in this picture and also uh, allude to and talk about weaving together in some of the other videos on my channel so um but anyway in this book and then also in this one and also in this one Peter Kingsley's name keeps coming up all of these scholars seem to disagree with a man named Dodds but agree with Peter Kingsley and and when they get to this part in the footnotes it's like the meat and potatoes of the issues right and so I followed those footnotes to find Peter Kingsley and to find this book that we're going to talk about today but if you go to Peter Kingsley's website you'll see that in, in and also if you're a student of religious studies and know uh you know sort of the key names of the big names especially under the umbrella or heading of mysticism um then you'll see that the that the people who recommend him it's a little bit astounding and you're like who okay this is like this is important information or or the the scholarship tends to agree that that what's being brought up here is sort of uh avant-garde in our discipline of religious studies mm -hmm. and um and so in that way uh you know i think he's an important thinker and writer um but it, he's also uh it, it also feels very much like he is working to embody the material and make it a practice and like actually move through the path of awakening via the material uh another thing that he really talks about is that we don't have to look in other traditions to find um the mystical path or the material that we need to affect theurgy or salvation we don't need to actually go to tibetan buddhism we don't actually need to go to hinduism or advaita vedanta or whatever sufism or whatever it may not be in our culture or or it may be in yours but you know for us in the west that this is something that i've felt my whole career in religious studies that we've had our birthright stolen from us that something happened there and um you know whether it have been 
for good reason, as Madame Blavatsky and other theosophical thinkers talk about, about the skip to the jump to reason and reasonable thinking and using the left brain. So with a, such a precise instrument, whether it be for reason or, you know, for a good reason or or be um, sort of something sort of shysty or shady that happened there. Um, whatever the reason at this point, like Rudolf Steiner talks about in the new Isis myth, it's time uh, with the age of Aquarius to come back and bring it back around, bring the, the left brain back around to the right and kind of create this synthesis of unity again in our consciousness and the way that we approach and think about the world. And uh, it seems that Peter Kingsley um, is a, a leader in this, in in a way of writing and thinking and speaking about uh, religious studies material, you know, from this vantage, and that he talks about like have um, dreams and things that he had that urged him in in this uh, direction, and additionally saying, um, you know, that one time I was like listening to Zogchen Panlap Rinpoche teach, uh, and it was actually in person in San Antonio. It was like a really odd, uh, fortunate thing that happened to me and I got to sit with him and talk with not talk with him but like sit right in front of him and he was teaching and you know he has a center up in Seattle and it's very interesting because they try to um, use like western hymns in there and it with Tibetan words and they're trying to you know kind of create more of a church western church situation with the buddhism or just trying to figure out ways that we in the west can be more authentic with our practice rather than just borrowing other people's way of doing things and one thing he said was that uh he looks forward to the day that that he sees artwork and pictures and boot of the buddhas and dakinis that look more like our faces the people that are in the west that he's trying to teach right um you know so i don't for what that's worth Okay, so I think that's enough. I, I want, do want to say about the context of this book that this book in particular is about a thinker named Empedocles, who is a pre-Socratic. So that means that he was before Socrates and kind of in the Orphic and Pythagorean teaching time that uh, Socrates would, that would have been the teachers of Socrates, who was the teachers teacher of Plato. And that a lot of the material also were looking to Iamblichus, who was, uh, you know, of course, a Neoplatonic, who was looking to Plato, you know, as his teacher, and kind of correcting some of the things that had gone wrong, you know, are not wrong, but had been started to be misunderstood, at least with regard to the right brain way of seeing the material. And um, also understanding that right brain, maybe science has said we don't have that anymore, but I think Ian McGilchrist is helping us to understand that, yes, maybe that we do, and that um, that at least in the least it's a useful way of talking about, because we're talking about the two pillars always in esoteric, esoteric studies, right? Like the two pillars are like the best metaphor ever because they're like part of everything. And so, um, you know, kind of talking about the more right-brained way of seeing things as opposed to the left-brain way of seeing things. And again, remember that mirror, mirror switch a rude thing okay so uh yeah empedocles um so he's basically kind of saying that like at the point of aristotle where aristotle and plato kind of got in an argument that um that maybe we started misunderstanding some of the things about the pre-socratics namely like empedocles was seen to be a bad poet and that like really didn't have anything to offer to a uh, serious scholarship on um you know ancient philosophy and 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 western studies right like our western spiritual tradition of that came from greece and that actually that was that's really not right and peter kingsley is correcting the record there and going back and showing us because this, we only have fragments and he's showing us how the it, it's been misinterpreted in the past and kind of filling out some of the metaphors and imagery for us so that we can understand what's being said there so that then we can begin to piece together uh, 
our own tradition. And with regard to borrowing and, and our uh, syncretic kind of uh, relationship that we have and of respect and gratitude for other cultures for helping us because it's really through, like we can see the correspondence and between, and that's, that's how we can understand what was being said in our own tradition without having had, having all of the words or even the print, you know, print or anything still there. We have little pieces. Um, so yes and so um uh so and let me just also like give a brief synopsis of of kind of what what this book is about and this book is about a lot about setting up the geography of the underworld and sort of the collective unconscious is as it comes out um it's kind of you know as you can see in my picture here which i apologize for my terrible artwork but there are some intriguing th things in this in image right and um you know so what i have here is a is a is we know we normally think of a three-part universe or a tripartite sort of uh nature of reality you know we have the physical realm we have the imaginal realm and then we have the source realm or you know the spirit realm or god right or source and um and so we usually see that in a three-part system and here you can see with the cursor that we've got like the the physical realm the um this imaginal realm and the source realm here but the way that pe through the course of this book what ends up coming out is a is a is an elongation of that view that shows you that that there's a surface or a horizon line and that beneath that surface that we also have those three pictures and that they actually you know of course wrap around you know to they wrap around and are reciprocal and you know are kind of more going more going like this, right? Um, the, and wrap wrap back around, and so you can kind of see that um, detailed here in the image, and that like this, this is the horizon line, and that you've got the above and the below, and and that what's what's below the earth or what's uh, in the collective unconscious, or that's below the surface of awareness that's bubbling up like a volcano. Uh, and bringing the light up from the depths of the earth or from the depths of the inside of us and it, of the collective unconscious and it bubbles up and lights up and we see it reflected above us, right? And that like what we see is the outer wheel the, of primary direction. We see that like the, you know, we see that's what we see reflected, um, which is, at, and what we see of it is actually an illusion based on our inner wheel which is below the surface and is more of the blue side and the below, behind the gate of Hecate. And so um, so this image begins to speak to that a, a, a bit. And uh, with my silly looking fish and plants, um, I actually wanted to put the elementals on here somewhere, but uh, you know, this, this drawing kind of took a long time already and it's ah, whatever. Um, so we'll get into some of uh, this. I think these keywords down here are actually really intriguing and we'll get into talking about that a little bit. So I'm gonna go ahead and go into the quotes because I, I know that probably most of you would most like to hear from Peter Kingsley who was really uh, um, masterful at sharing this information. So I've pulled out um, some quotes and we're going to put it into topics. And so uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is this kind of creation myth and, and kind of uh, cosmogony going on here in the pre-Socratic system. So let me read these out loud to you. So Empedocles' account of what happened at the start of our world, he himself had described how Aether, the first element to separate out from the primal chaotic mass, rose up until it reached the fixed boundary of the cosmos. Then came fire, heavier than Aether, yet more volatile, and it ran up to the Aether and spread through it, creating that blazy, fiery hemisphere which Theophrastus mistook for the phenomenon still existing now. But that was not the end of the matter. Next, the fire interacted with the aether, glazing and crystallizing it and creating the brilliant crystalline heaven, which lights up so spectacularly in the Mediterranean climates when the sun rises every day. Small pockets of fire became trapped in this crystalline aether, becoming what we now perceive as the fixed stars. And then the more crucial event of all occurred. So much fire at the upper boundary of the cosmos made the, made the universe top heavy. 
the fire started to weigh downwards, tilting the universe and the celestial pole in the process. And as it slid down the circular boundary of the universe, it accumulated into one concentrated body of fire, our, our familiar sun. The creation of the planets and the moon was also described as part of this cosmic transformation. And um, the only kind of commentary that I'm going to add on this right now is to just say that I think it's really interesting that it reminds me of um, how the theosophists the theosophical school talks and Rudolph and the anthroposophical school talks about like a process of cosmogony and about how there were seven phases, which kind of correspond to those seven uh, little rings in the inner wheel that are talked about in time as, um, but that as well as other procession of equinox, et cetera, but that, that, that there's this cosmogony going on and it's a, it's an evolutionary process, like moving from the old moon phase to the sun phase or however that went, I would need a refresher, but like, it's not a process that stays static and that the, um, the actual cosmology, the view of it changes as that, um, as that process happens, which is somewhat intriguing, especially for our current moment, as we edge into one of those other uh, circles of the wheel uh, on the inner wheel into the Aquarian age, uh, you know, at, at least we're having uh, forerunners of that, like light bearers or people who are, uh, I can't think of the right word, but pathfinders or people who kind of come first or start to like, start to talk about the things that are actually going to be part of the um, lessons of the Aquarian age and how we're going to, what, what the less soul lesson is there. Um, okay. So the next quote, fire pushing up from the depths of the earth. Oh, I love this quote fire pushing up from the depths of the earth, raised up the benighted shoots of humanity and left them still sexually undifferentiated on the earth's surface as it rushed to the heavens to join the fire that was accumulating there. And so it's talking about in this the image that's being created here. You know, it's it's saying how this fire rushed down and started to gather down here, and then it came. It's starting to come up, pushing up like a volcano from the depths of the earth. And that you can just I can just see these little you know little people, right? But they're like fire people all along this line of the of the event horizon, you know, or the equator, the 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 plane of inertia, you know, that is the the that we're standing on uh, that feels like solid ground and the fire's pushing up through that. And it's not, it's not, they're sexually undifferentiated. Like we're souls here. <laughs> and um, also maybe we're like Hermet Hermes, you know, that's male and female. Uh, but nonetheless, like it's talking about our Promethean spark and that how that is, um, and it continues to rise up. Uh, as it rushed to the heavens to join the fire that's accumulating there and that's going to become the sun. And this is like setting up, we know that there's a correspondence between our actual physical heart and the sun that we see in the sky. They are the same thing, right? It's just correspondence. Um, you know, it's like separated out in the run rings of correspondences. And so like, this is what's being, you know, spoken to here. And he's saying, though, the point being that, in other words, Empedocles is not only stating that the fire which eventually rose up to become the sun had its origin in the bowels of the earth, but also implying that the source of daylight and illumination derives ultimately from the dark depths of the underworld. You know, so, you know, through this, we're seeing how how the arising happens, how our experience of reality happens. And if we, you know, kind of think about this from the vantage of our practice and philosophy and things that we know about esoteric studies, you know, it makes a lot of sense about how that it's, you know, things that are coming up out of the collective unconscious for us to look at and, you know, and how we're watching the shadow play of that kind of in the, in the arising. Okay. Um, so um, I, I think I've offered a lot of commentary and I really want to uh, give you guys what Peter Kingsley has to say, because I know that it's um, really important. And so um, the next section that we're going to talk about is about how how there's this correspondence between the fires that like of our heart um, and the stars above us or of the sun, you know, and how that like it's a reflection of above and below 
and how that's working a little bit and how we see it talked about in this book. So there's a fragment from Proclus that says, there are many fires burning beneath the surface of the earth. Uh, and then in Homer's Iliad, book eight, Hector tells his army to make preparations so that all night long until the early birth of dawn, <laughs> all night long until the early birth of dawn, we can burn many fires and the blaze will reach till heaven. Just as significantly, the very last words of the Iliad, book eight, draw a detailed analogy between the many fires which were burning throughout the night and the brilliance of the stars in heaven. What makes this web of illusions all the more meaningful is the fact that for Empedocles, the blaze which rose up to heaven from his many fires actually created the celestial bodies. Analogy becomes identity, metaphor, and fact. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I love this because it... Um, it speaks to that the fact that what's bubbling up from the collective unconsciousness and that we're seeing like an, our spark and then it's becoming the stars that are lining up and creating the reality um, that that we can burn that we burn these fires like our light upon light or the light that we receive at this winter solstice and that kiss moment from the sun uh, that relights our blaze and so that we can show up as warriors for the world etc that we can burn these lights from the from the dark all night long like through the darkness until the dawn of awakening happens and it just reminds me of the like light light upon light and how the light of candles jump and these sorts of things and you know and uh it's just it's really interesting but what was and inspirational but what is also interesting is that you know just saying that that these fires that the fi that the light that we bring actually creates the reality like that's actually creating the stars and that you know like what we're showing up with creates creates what we're seeing out there so that we can kind of get a view of what's in our collective unconscious or what's in our personal unconscious, which I don't know if it's actually personal, but the, what's in the unconscious or out of awareness that we can see that by looking at the stars. Like we can get something, some more information to help us navigate more skillfully in that way. Like that is true is what is being said here in a deeper way. Okay. And so, um, okay. So, um, and then now he's going to talk about the dark sun a little bit and say that above all, it was the alchemical tradition that was responsible for, for preserving and maintaining this basic association between the sun, earth, and the underworld. And the alchemists from the end of antiquity through and beyond the Middle Ages and Renaissance were so concerned with the paradoxical discovery of light in the depths of darkness that they undercut all the familiar distinctions between upper and lower, celestial and terrestrial. For them, fire was only secondarily a celestial phenomenon, and its origin came from and belonged at the center of the earth. This center, central fire, as they sometimes called it, was considered by them the key to the alchemical transformation process. According to them, it was the real source of light, so much so that they referred to it as the sun and the earth or the subterranean sun. And like it, that's like, you know, have you seen uh, seen the sun at midnight? is like a, a esoteric koan right um for students on the path like until you see the sun at midnight or something like this and i mean i think that we've kind of covered what he's talking about here um you know as far as that that in the depths of the inner real and it, the our act what's rising up for to be from the collective unconscious to be looked at you know kind of this sort of thing but i think that that what is interesting here is that he says that even the alchemists only saw that as a secondary, as a secondarily a celestial phenomenon. But when really it's primary, like they're both exactly happening in tandem. It is the same thing. It's a reflection from above and below. It's like we're seeing it ref what's above, we're seeing reflected on the water, but where it's originating is actually below the water. You know, you think it's originating up here, but it's originating down below and then you're and it's coming up <laughs> and then it's happening. We're making it happen and then we're watching it reflected on the water. It's just like, you know, kind of helping us to see how this is happening inside of us. OK, 
And so, um, okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, like the geography of the underworld and see what we can learn about our process, you know, kind of from, from thinking about the, the geography of Tartar, Tartarus. Uh, so near to its source, uh, so these are just kind of some, some quotes that help get us kind of in the area of what Peter Kingsley is talking about. And it's, we're talking about, I believe, the river Styx here, um, you know, the river that has the seven, it, it, it's in the underworld, and it like rings the underworld or Hades seven times, okay? And this is what it's passing as it does that. So I'm going to start again. Near to its source, it falls into a vast region burning with much fire. There it creates a lake larger than the Mediterranean, boiling with water and mud. From there turbid and muddy. It flows off in a circle. After passing through various other regions and winding its course inside the earth, it arrives at the far end of the Acarusian lake, but instead of mingling with the waters of the lake, it continues to circle seven times underneath the earth before discharging into the lower level of Tartarus. For example, the most Striking item of underworld symbolism in those earlier Orphic allusions recurs repeatedly in the underworld geography of the final myth, the mention of lying in the mud, those who have committed crimes, in particular the crime of raising their hand in violence against their father or mother, are forced to lie in the mud in the underworld close to this Ar Arusian lake. And so um, we're talking about four rivers in the underworld and these four rivers end up um, having correspondence with the four elements and he's kind of just describing here how you know how it's winding around and making a circle inside of the earth and how the movement's happening and you know and from meditating sort of and thinking on this geography I believe we could probably get some uh, useful um like a dig into what's going on there to help us in our practice, maybe. Um, but but basically, there are four rivers in the underworld: Ocean, Archon, Coctus, and Prifeltion. And and that and this idea, though, um, that that you know, it's just really interesting because he's you know we know that like part of the underworld is like one of the one of the lakes that's created is the lake of Lethe, right? And we know that that in reincarnation stories that from Greece uh, that the that souls drank from the lake of Lethe before they came, were were incarnated, and that helped them to forget all of their past life and what happened in their underworld experience and things like this. They 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 drank from the lake of forgetfulness, and then they were born. So then they're born up on the earth, um, you know. So and then there's all you know. Also in one of these lakes, we're seeing that that one of the lakes, like if you is is for purifying and and. And that like, you know, that you go there and you have to lie face down in the mud, sort of repentance, right? And the mud is kind of, you know, in alchemy, we think of like water and earth mixing. So it's emotion and earth like that, which is like becomes so dense that it's hard and dry. And then so the emotion and the reflectivity of reflecting on our actions and what created that density and what created those clashes and karma like knots that we like lie face down like repenting like almost like doing prostrations face down repenting oh and trying to mix like our re re reflective process of uh, uh, things that water represent connectivity uh slowing down moving inwards and downwards and you know we mix this so it's mud and we're lying there and then we need to go actually actually get into the lake to wash it off of us and be purified of this, which reminds me of Vajrasattva practice and things like this. Um, so just sort of thinking about these things that are going on in the Greek system in the underworld, you know, and how how that works in the philosophy, you know, and, and also thinking about how like it's not only when we die that we reincarnate that we actually, there's like a gap between every second, like the world is not solid. It's like there are gaps in between every second and that there's a reincarnation happening every single second and millisecond. And, but even, you know, we can slow that down and think, okay, well also every year, every year we're reborn at winter solstice. 
we rekindle our light to go again for another round, you know, so we can like reincarnation happens more frequently than just between life and death and how we can maybe think about what's going on here in the underworld and um, to more skillfully navigate uh, our ultimate goal on the path. And um, I'm not sure if I read this part that the, the the quote in blue is from Wikipedia because I just found this interesting and I didn't know a lot about these rivers. And it says that in Plato's Phaedo, souls are divided into four different categories. Evil souls are sent to Tartarus. Good souls are sent onward to pure places of the world. But neutral souls, as well as repentant people who performed great crimes, are not immediately sent to the next realm. Neutral souls are cleansed in this lake before proceeding onward similar to good souls but slower people who committed great evil uh yet were repentant yet were repentant can hope that their victims invite them into this lake where they can undergo the cleansing process and so um you know you can i can see although i don't know very much or enough about catholicism and i would really love to know more because i was raised protestant um but you know, we can see some of these things make it into like, is it called catechism or like the study of Catholicism, uh, be, you know, of like purgatory. And, uh, you know, we know that in the past that, that ancestors, like you would buy, uh, you would buy penances for your ancestors and pray that they can make it. It also reminds me of like praying so that somebody can go to Valhalla, like they're waiting outside of Valhalla, but the, there's, there are things that you can do to help them get in. And so that this was, and that, that are we remembering that we can do that for our ancestors, which <laughs> makes me cry. Cause like, am I doing that for my dad? you know, it's Father's Day tomorrow, you know, like, am I doing that for my dad? And what more could I do, do you know, to help him? Uh, and also just all the other beings around us in every minute, because we're, you know, every single being is our, has been our mother in a past lifetime. And like, what are we doing to, to try to help them to make that gap and make that jump so that when they, rec they reincarnate, it's into, you know, to the beautiful kingdom of God or whatever it is that is uh, beautiful and of the light and what we're striving for in order to help ease the suffering of beings that we all know that we're experiencing here in this desire realm. Um, okay, so yeah, so um, let's see, let's keep, let's keep on moving down here with the quotes. So um, the four underworld rivers are connected to the elements Right. And so I kind of alluded to that here in the drawing that I made because it reminded me of Tibetan Buddhist practice and things that I learned from Lama Sultra Maloney, which has to do with using uh, intention or seed syllables in order to transform some of our afflictive emotions into more helpful emotions, or maybe those aren't the right words. But like, for instance, um, at the ground of being that like we have an ultimate sense of confusion or ignorance of our true nature in other words we have an ignorance we're like focusing on this inner wheel here and we're like thinking it's so real and we're like in this mind trip of like what's going on and that we have an ignorance of actually the like spontaneous like beauty uh, and that Buddha fields that are actually all around us in every moment so that when we're watching the direction of the outer wheel the primary direction that we're watching this totally confused version that is our trip but really really it's appearing perfect and spontaneously beautiful we're just not seeing that and so um you know so transforming our confusion or our ignorance of our own true nature and also like truly we are a buddha we have buddha nature we just are really confused and neurotic and so we're not showing up as a buddha but um so that's kind of like our confusion and our ignorance and transforming that into clarity to being able to see the essential nature of emptiness right it's not as solid as all that uh you know and that that a lot of our confusion is um, is just that confusion, smoke and darkness and cl and lack of clarity or O cell, which is clear light. Uh, so transforming that dark light into clear light um, at the ground of being through the seed syllable bomb, um, you know, and 
and then then in that way it's below so then it when it comes up bomb the words and vibration create what happens and create that wave and so then it creates it and clarity is the idea that we can work with this in our practice um but yeah um, it sort of takes a while, as I can say from experience, because uh, I've been doing it for a while and I wouldn't say that I'm at OCEL yet. Um, another one of the seed syllables would be anger. Uh, it would be ha, which is the water element, and that it relates to um, transforming anger into patience. Like, and, and it's also that that these things have a remedy. So the remedy for, for anger is patience. If we apply patience, it dissolves our anger. Kind of in the way that you have a polarity in Gemini, you know, like one side of the coin, the other side of the coin, and then you triangulate it. It 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 remedies it and it and tri triangles are what move up and down, right? Or down and then create circles. And so we become that sphere of, of divinity rather than rectilinear, as as Iamblichus talks about. Um, and, and Gregory Shaw. And um, so, yeah, so uh, the remedy to, to anger is patience. And so if we're feeling angry about something, how can we maybe put more time in it, be more patient with that thing? You know, uh, you know, I think of patience as, oh, I'm patient with the dog, or I'm patient with the child, or I'm patient with somebody who's like, you know, like, has anxiety or you know patience just slowing down and being willing to hold space and you know these sorts of things transform that and then what comes up from the surface is more uh, a more beautiful version of of the arising um and then in the southern corner uh we put in i've been taught through lama sultram taught me to put um the the earth element in the southern corner, which is Ra, Ri, or the Ratna Dakini, um, and is the earth element, and that that this is pride, and pride is trans like we use equanimity to transform pride, or just thinking that like we're the chiz and like we're so awesome, and like more thinking about how everybody's awesome, everything is awesome, um, so you know like that the that's for the earth element. Um, and so, uh, which would be like coins, right? And these sorts of things. And then in the, in the Western side, we uh, put fire on the Western side and that's desire and how desire can be transformed by bliss. And this is like by chasing your heart bliss, right? That's more agape and the eros kind of, and like this heart bliss of like chasing the, the light and the truth and, and spirit and God and the guru and, you know, everything uh, like that following your bliss as opposed to desiring things and be like, eh, I want that and getting all like, or even shadowy seedy desires versus, you know, more bliss, light and blissful and happy, joyous <clears throat> experiences and how we can work with those two um, ideas and, and try and get them. And then in the in the, the northern corner, which is the most interesting corner for this presentation, because the northern corner, as John Baptiste Morin teaches, is the pit, uh, and it's the fourth house that I see. And we know in astrology that the I see is the spot, like if the sun rises here in the daytime, oh, I guess we'd say here, if it comes through up the horizon and rises in the east and culminates in the south and the daytime sets in the west, when it comes here to the north is where it dies and is reborn for the day. This is the midnight point of the chart. This is the winter solstice. It's the least amount of sunlight, right, in the scheme of the year, you know, and these sorts of things. And so this is the point in the pit, in Tartarus, the pit where the sun is reborn. So, you know, even connecting it to astrology, which wasn't in Peter Kingsley. So, you know, it does connect. We can use this information to improve our practice of astrology uh, and thinking about the philosophy, like as opposed to just the methodology um, in this moment where we're trying to do that as astrologers. And so, um, yeah. And so, uh, at the northern corner and we use uh, jealousy is the air element uh, you know that thinking of uh, oh my precious like golem right or whatever um, and we can move beyond being jealous uh, by by going beyond hope and fear which both hope the high 
and fear, the low, are things that we want to try to avoid. We want to try to keep the middle path, right? And But it's more about moving beyond hope because if we hope things are going to get better, you know, there's it's kind of weird because, what? oh, it gets better for me, but what about all the suffering beings in the world? Or it gets better, but I can't hold on to it because of impermanence, right? Or I fear the worst is going to happen. And, you know, and I'm not trusting that God has my back and that spirit has a plan for me that I you know, not that, not my will, but thine. Right. And so like, you know, these are like thoughts, you know, and how do we get in, how do we, how do we deal with the air element, which often manifests in its bad nature as being jealous of somebody else or comparative mind or these sorts of things. And that we can, that working with the air element and the seed syllable, sa, and the, and the, um, Okay, Buddha, Vajra Dakini is water, Ratna Dakini is is earth. Um, um, um it's karma dakini that's blue. Anyway, I forget what the uh Padma Dakini is the red one. So, you know, we can work with these things and there are practices in the Tibetan system that can help us, you know, to do that, to maybe tap into what some of the practices might have been that we've lost in our own tradition when various books got burned or or things happened along the way that we lost our access to these things, largely because we um, devalued them in our rational quest for uh, scientific uh, precision and glory, because <laughs> we did do some cool things. Okay, so um, I think I said this part, but this interpretation of the river of fire, the idea of metaphysical correspondence between the geography of the underworld and the microcosm of human passions, is assumed nowadays to be a uniquely Neoplatonic creation. And then he's going on to say that it goes back even further than that to the pre-Socratics. And my point, though, in bringing it up to you is that this is totally part of the Neoplatonic Neo system in, of create, you know, what's going on there. And that, you know, um, oh, and I wanted to bring up one more thing. Let me just grab it real quick. I should have had this pulled up and ready to go, but I'm just going to, oh boy. Well, it's a picture of, of Jean, Jean Baptiste Marin that I had like kind of outlined this and I will put this at the end. I'll, I'll, I'll put a picture of it so you can see it in the video if you want to look at it. Um, but it's interesting because it's houses by triplicity and angle. And like, it's like, say, you know, it's like connecting the first house to the fifth house to the ninth house. Uh, it, uh, and, but the thing about it is that it's elements, we're connecting the elements, you know? And so it's kind of interesting. I'm just thinking about ways that we can use this information actually in our astrology practice and, and you know, and to kind of fill out some of those things. And I think that this might be a key. This might be something that we could go back and look at and figure out, um, you know, well, the elements, like they're arising. So if your first house is a fire element, then, you know, it's, we we can connect the the first house, the ninth house, and the fifth house is a fire element, and so we're working with the element of fire, and and when we're you know bubbling up from the surface, those houses are bubbling up in the element of fire, whereas others would be in air and earth, etc. And also, additionally, which ones in the pit, etc. Okay, and so um, back to the Peter Kingsley quotes here. Um, so. Now we're going to talk about, and this is my favorite part of this of this book, and mostly just because I'm kind of a nerd and and uh, with the, regard to the geocentric versus heliocentric system, and I um, I ran into my friend Santos Bonacci because I had been having some dreams and that like his work, like I tapped into it and I was like, whoa, that's like exactly what I'm trying to figure out, and so he and I have had a number of conversations about what I was immediately interested in when I saw his work was the, was like mirror image charts or the backwards on the wheel side or what's happening on this other side behind, I like there's the gate of Hecate and what's happening on the other side of it in this unconscious realm, which is like what this whole book is kind of about, which is, you know, kind of overwhelming to me. And I'm so grateful for it. Um, for having found it and for this work and that that Peter Kingsley has put this together because it's super helpful um, to understanding well to what I want to understand um, but but anyway so I, I find this really interesting because um, I do believe that that the 
I've said for a long time that the geocentric system is the key to the un, to the magical worldview. Like putting yourself back in a geocentric view is key to understanding the magical worldview, which is key to affecting theurgy, which is key to getting your light body running again. Because that and and I'm not going to get into like conspiracy theories, but I do sometimes wonder if if and when, and I actually have this video on my channel, but I took it down, which was about, anyway, but was about it being a conspiracy. In the, but like, um, you know, I just wonder, like, you know, it, it's just interesting that we were pulled aside from that view because like, it's the key to the, it's the key to, it's the key to the esoteric drop. It's the key to everything is this view. And um, it's really a shame that, uh, that my friend Santos has been so disparaged by the astrological community because what he's brought and given to us is actually exactly what we need. And so, uh, yeah. And so um, I find this piece of information that I'm getting ready to share with you so fascinating because um, we're going to talk about this guy, Philo Laius, who I didn't know about at all. And there's apparently, uh, he had a cosmological scheme and it's the one that Copernicus was looking at and went to, to and why he thought that the sun was at the center of the earth. And it's really a misunderstanding of the Philolaic system. Um, and Peter Kingsley very clearly and very um, kindly, like compassionately lays this down in the quotes that I'm going to share for you. He's very clearly sharing the same understanding that I'm coming from, um, that I was helped to understand because a hundred percent because of my friend Santos and what the things that he taught me so freely. Um, but so I'm going to read these things to you now and then maybe offer a little more commentary afterwards. So here's the quote, the correspondence between the central fire and Tartarus makes, as we have seen, excellent sense of the remaining correspondence between counter earth and Hades. Oh, basically, I think I typed that wrong, but like he's saying, so like we've seen that the correspondence between Tartarus and Hades and the sunlight being in the pit of the earth, like that seems counterintuitive. But when you think about it, it actually makes excellent sense, right? It does. It makes excellent sense. And, you know, it's like, and it's super cool, but he's going to say that, that it's a little harder to see how this counter earth that Philolaus talks about is Hades. And so basically in this Philolaic schema, it's like a ge it's like geocentric rings, but one of the rings, as far as academics have it drawn now, which I think is wrong, it, and, but the fragments are expensive and I don't have a copy of them yet and would like that if anyone has it. But um, but the, like it's it's these geocentric rings and there's a picture of the counter earth kind of like being a planet or on one of the rings. But I don't think that's how it looks at all. Like what we're talking about here is the counter space. We're talking about how like, and if you go to that, like there's a video of me and Santos talking and I'm saying, but what about what happens on this other side? And he's explaining how, when you have a point of light, it goes forward, but it also at the same time goes backwards. There's the pullback. It's in both directions at the same time. And what we're talking about with the counter earth is the other direction on the other side and also the inner wheel, you know, so let's end the blue shift and Joachim and everything of the blue pillar, you know, that's what we're talking about with this counter earth. So you wouldn't actually put that on one of the circular wheels. It's the mirror image. It's what's coming out. And so like uh, here in this diagram, it's like if the airy shift is happening this way, it's also happening this way. And I will say that I did say in the video about the Timaeus, like I wondered what Santos, how he would have drawn those two wheels. And this is my guess. I don't know if it's right because it feels weird to me that the Aries shift is going down instead of up, but I think it's because it's mirror image. And so uh, that it works that way. Um, and and so I did one time ask Santos this question and he had said, it's Aries and Aries. And so not Aries and Pisces, like, cause I was trying to draw this as blue with Pisces here. And he's like, no, no, it's Aries and Aries. So I don't know if that's actually, if my understanding is right. And this is actually right. And we still need to pull him in to understand how he would draw this. Cause I think he's got his mind around it uh, just naturally from, because this is the piece of what he's bringing to us as a collective. So um, 
Yeah, so he's saying that the that the correspondence between the central fire and Tartarus makes good sense, but but what about this uh, correspondence between the counter Earth and Hades? And he says it act, there's nothing difficult at all here. First, it will be noted that the most prominent single characteristic of the Philolaic counter Earth is its invisibility, also an essential characteristic of Hades. Second, like Hades, the counter Earth is also has a peculiar feature of possessing inhabitants whom we are unable to see from our normal perspective on the surface of the Earth. Um, third, the very name of the counter Earth, anti Chiton, plunges us even further into the substratum of mythical ideas underlying the seemingly scientific facade of the Philolaic scheme. The name can, to some extent, be explained by the detail mentioned earlier, that the counter-Earth would seem to maintain a position over and against or opposite our Earth during its circle around the central fire, like it's on the other side. Um, but, but this explanation ultimately falls flat <laughs> and begins to satisfy uh, our account and fails to satisfy our account sufficiently for how both the word and idea itself came into being. On the other hand, the literal sense of the anti-earth would also word also evokes the idea of an earth in reverse, a kind of shadow earth, a reflected or looking glass earth, which represents the other world, the world of the dead. A, the Pythagorean variant of the Philolaic scheme known to us from Alexandrian times maintained that the geocentric view of the universe, oh, maintained the geocentric view of the universe by identifying the counter earth with some invisible body, uh, or not with some invisible body, but with the moon. Okay. So like there was there in the Alexandrian times, there was a, a version of the Philolaic scheme that rather than saying that this counter earth was invisible, they, inv they said it was the moon. But he goes on to say that that same source that says all explains that the lunar counter Earth was identified with Hades. So, you know, the same source says, oh, it's not invisible. It's the moon, but it um, is still Hades. And like, really, this is like if you know about esoteric studies and about the two pillars of Solomon and the understanding of the information of the blue pillar of Joachim, that we understand, or Joachim, we understand that it's the moon, right? And it's Hades, it's it's the it's Hecate, it's the it's you know, it's the monsters, it's that it's the dead people, it's that side of the Scorpio Taurus axis, right? Taurus is the fairies and the and the good like the elementals, and I should have drawn the elementals up here, uh, you know, at the top here, because Taurus is those elementals and the Buddhas and the and the pretty things, whereas Scorpio is the darkness, the underworld, the Tartarus, the the monsters, the dead people, the shades, the things that are in the collective unconscious that we can't see and don't are not in the light of awareness, and so. Um, yeah, so uh, the Philolaic system gave us two names for the count. Oh, I'm, I'm going to wait before I say that. I'm going to say just a little bit more, just that we see here that like, um, you know, I don't think that it would be academic suicide for him to maybe come out with a geocentric view, or and maybe he's not even saying that at all. It's probably a lot like what Rudolf Steiner teaches on that topic, which he talks about the view depends on where you're standing and what you're trying to do, Right. You know, like if we we can easily think about what's the G, what is the heliocentric astrology, what is the view from the sun, and like and think about it in terms of that, like what does it mean? We could come up with some really meaningful metaphors, I'm sure, and correspondences and way to work with that material using that view. But we could also do it from Mars, or we could do it from a fixed star out, you know, form a halt. Or we could do it from, you know, anywhere we could like, it's it's about mathematics and 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 formulas and, and how you get those formulas to work. And Rudolf Steiner additionally said that like those uh, Copernican, he, Rudolf Steiner was not down with Copernicus. He liked talk at Tycho Brahe, but, um, but additionally, like, it, and he couldn't say this because he was going to totally ruin all the great work he had done. Um, 
you know, because it sounds ridiculous. Think about how people talk about flat earthers. Like it's like you they're so disparaging and they think and I kind of think that that word was meant to push the concept through the consciousness faster. But I think it's kind of like Black Lives Matter. It did us a disservice because it's like the poetics of it are off. But um, but, you know, like Rudolf Steiner was really trying to do something about educating children and bringing up a generation of sensitive souls that could learn how to see the subtle realms and kind of bring forward information, just like Peter Kingsley has helped us with here. And so he didn't want to cut his nose off despite his face, you know, but he did um, talk about how the Copernican models, like how the how the time, like the t amount of time it would take the light to get to us and things like this were just not syncretizing for him. And so, and he actually says things pretty, um, he comes down pretty hard on it, honestly. And I have some quotes about that. And if you wanted to learn more about that, you grab this. Well, you guys can't see with my picture so small. It's over here, but it's Elizabeth Breed. The Elizabeth Breed Anthroposophy and Astrology book is really helpful on that topic. Um, but anyways, we can see um, my point here is just how interesting it is that I didn't know that there was a philolaic system and I didn't know that there was a counter earth in that philolaic system. And I didn't know that potential that it likely and strongly relates to the um, we call it perennial wisdom teachings of the two pillars and how this has been. There's been that uh, break of understanding that happened with Aristotle, correspondingly also with the birth of rise of Christianity and uh, things that happened in that time. And um, we have lost track of, of our ability to understand the information, which also has us uh, having lost track of the magical worldview in general, of our view, view of like what's going on here, which um, and I sort of understand the view of like the cosmological view is a lot more like this chalkboard that I've drawn that even talking about what's the shape of the earth is somewhat short sighted because we're just that's only the physical shape that we've also got the imaginal realm and that's like a super sensible realm and what does that look like and what's the view from that perspective I mean it's almost like we're like little bugs or something like in our view is like oh yeah it looks like that. And it's like, but does it really look like that? And so when we get up into like higher levels of consciousness, what does it look like? And what do the beings look like? What do the planets look like? And, you know, Steiner and others and even Santos will tell you what he thinks those planets look like. Even Greg Shaw will tell you that they're spherical of light beings, like Merkaba is kind of thing going on. And that that any way that the material view is physical view is somewhat short sighted, yet also is a is kind of a fighting point because um it if without the magical worldview without the geocentric magical worldview you're not going to understand where the rings are on your body you're not going to understand how the inner ring moves and where that is in the in the arising you're not going to understand how the wheel moves by primary direction like the 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 primary wheel the red wheel how that moves and where that is on your body you're not going to understand the correspondence between this cycle of the year of breathing and what time you do what and how you get the circadian rhythm of your life that lined up like you know because again the gregorian calendar has us all off and so you know i do think that it's a really is a point um of contention um, but then on top of that, when, when you are disparaged over and over and over for bringing the truth, it's a very sad, it's a very, um, it's a, it's a, a situation of, that's very hard, um, I would imagine. So um, uh, additionally, um, so I did want to say that like, uh, w that in this book, it says that when he comes to describe the all important shape of this true earth he presents it as an enormous 12-sided ball evidently a reference to the dodecahedron which you know i love that but then also are we not looking at this as a torus field as a 12-sided ball uh, you know is that not the view that we've been given you know in this in the universal truth school is that not the view like it's a 12-sided ball it's got aries rises and taurus we got the taurus field created our heart you know, blah, 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 you know like the whole thing that is the 12-sided ball not a spinning ball and we're inside of the ball and it's da 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 and the ball is part it's like a dome around us but nonetheless it's still a sphere we're woo, 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 it's still a sphere right it's just that we're not on top of the sphere we're not standing on the 
outside of it and like upside down and et cetera. Like that view is really ridiculous. And um, so it, you know, maybe I, I would love to see academics take it more seriously. Um, but, uh, uh, and then the last thing I want to cover in this video is because I think this helps us connect it to our astrology practice again a little more, is that in the Philolaic system that, that there were two names given for the counter earth, um, the prison of Zeus or Zeus's sentry post. And this is referring to the mythology of the Titans and the Olympians and the casting of the Titans into the pit of Tartarus. And so <clears throat> we know that in that story, it was Zeus and Sa uh, Jupiter and Saturn that square off, right? And that Saturn time, Kronos, is, it's karma. It's back there in the Hecate side. It's in the blue side, <clears throat> in the Hades side, and that our karma is down there. And that's what's bubbling up. And that, um, and that Jupiter, our philosophy and our, you know, optimism, like, okay, we're going to have to go through this uh, sort of suffering process in order to learn more, et cetera, and to purify ourselves and to refine our light. Uh, and also uh, there was uh, like, uh, like Vulcan, like create something beautiful out of the fire. Um, like, um, yeah, that although we're going to have to do that, Jupiter keeps us positive and helps us see the philosophy and create the view and keeps us moving on that process that's kind of above. He's like, the view is guarding it, guarding what's happening with the karma. And then also just thinking about like, I do think that we could uh, apply this to the planets, our personal planets and in, in our charts, but that also we could apply it to cycles. Uh, and the larger outer planet cycles, et cetera, because we know we just had a big Jupiter-Saturn conjunction that, um, and the beginning of an airy trigon with related to the age of Aquarius, but the beginning, excuse me, of an airy trigon and that that hitting of Jupiter and Saturn, uh, Saturn, which throws Saturn into the pit, you know? And so that's like, we've just gone through a point where we are remaking the reality based on a new philosophy, you know, like, because the old way of seeing things like we, we, that we were done with that. And so we, we processed that and threw it into the pit. Um, and that, you know, anyway, so that with the larger planet cycles, that there's some ways of thinking about this as well and applying this to our practice and our, our overall understanding. Um, and there was one more thing I was going to say, um, Oh, which was about the fire. Fire has two, it, it, this was on here and I just forgot to point it out, but that fire, it said that there's like Hades and Vulcan or, or um, you know, so fire is both destructive and creative and that, you know, kind of thinking about the two sides of the coin and, and where you are on the wheel, uh, you know, if you're going out, it's creative and it's the spark and I'm bringing, I'm bringing the spark. I'm going to create my rose this year on the red shift, or if it's going back down to the blue shift of the year and that the more, uh, the, the in breath where we're working on the in breath of the year, um, you know, kind of, it's more destructive and tearing down. Uh, so that's, you know, ad additionally interesting. And so, um, yeah, I think with that, like on that note too, just remembering that it's um, we're about to have summer solstice and just when, wishing everyone both a happy Father's Day and a happy summer solstice and merry summer solstice. And that um, just really hoping that whatever rose that you ended up growing this year and the cycle of the growing season that, you know, that you remember to lift it up to spirit and lift it up to the Father and lift it up to God and offer it. Um, even if it's not perfect, like this video and this presentation, right? Like lift it up and offer it uh, with your true heart and for the benefit of beings so that, you know, spirit and God can do with whatever, with your gift, what he will. And you know that that's the moment where the gift become that our heart and our rose becomes inoculated. And we, it, in that moment of the summer solstice, and then it begins to fruit. And then there's the, the process that happens in August of the lion's gate and where the heart can overflow and flood the, flood the field so that next year's harvest um, will be fruitful. Uh, you know, so there's more of a process. So even if it's not the greatest rose, right? Like there's still more that we're doing this summer uh, with regard to our growing process. And there's, you know, still much more that needs to happen, that will happen uh, of blessings for all of us um, during this kind of difficult summer of a Venus retrograde um, and a, a time when Venus is not going to meet with Mars, etc. cetera. Um, 
So with that being said, thank you for being here and thank you for being a part of the channel. Thank you especially for any comments or feedback or suggestions that you might have and constructive uh, feedback and more information because I know a lot of you know a lot about this and I'm sorry if it wasn't the best, uh, most uh, hard-hitting left-brain um presentation it's just not my year for that and um but i do i i did nonetheless want to revisit the channel mostly because like i just this is an outlet that really feeds my soul and i i really this uh reciprocal conversation and energy just really uh brings a lot of benefit to my life and i'm really grateful for you and for this opportunity to speak with you today so thank you and um just additionally wanted to say to peter kingsley if he's out there which i doubt you know oh duh that's so silly right but if by chance he is out there i just wanted to say thank you and thank you for your work and just also for the example that you set and um and that i'm looking forward to reading um, I'm working on reality now and then and book of life is one that I really want to read but I'm kind of saving but and I also have this one about Carl Jung and so um, I, I appreciate that it's helping me to be a better student and a better practitioner on the path which is really my aim and what I hope to accomplish because you know if anything I just don't want to hurt beings any I don't want to cause suffering and I, I want to kind of figure out my deal so that I can stop hurting people and also and kind of come into clarity and also uh so I can bring a stronger light and uh so that I can help ease the suffering of of, of being so that they can see when when because we all fall short at times right and it's like the oh your light's going out look here here's a little light you know this sort of thing and so thank you for helping me and uh, and inspiring me. And thanks to the rest of you for being here. Happy Father's Day. Merry summer solstice. I love you guys. Bye.